Here you Ralph. Okay. Hope we get the sound right. Are you, are you okay with it? Right? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming, and I'm very pleased to be here myself. Um, I began research in 1976 on the, the topic of ancient British history. Now, prior to that, I took a degree in economics in a university, and I worked in industry. And I got to, well, there's no exaggeration, quite high level. And I worked mainly in steelworks and then into the rebuilding and reconstruction of shipyards. And there are numbers, or there were numbers in the pre-computer age of planning techniques, because in a shipyard you have thousands of men doing millions of man-hours, doing hundreds of different tasks with thousands of different bits in dozens of departments, and they all have to come together at the right time, in the right places, with all the right tools and all the right services to make the ship. British shipyards in the era were doing that. They were making one ship to the Continental and Japanese 11. That's how bad it had got. So I did some pretty high-level jobs. I, I worked. The governed shipyards had a work in. The workers occupied the yards and they threw the management out. It was insurrection. They should have sent the army in instead of which they sent me. So I got them going again. And uh, I dealt with the rebuilding of shipyards in Italy for warships and so on and so on. And I'd come to the point where I was absolutely fed up with it and I had enough money. And my colleague, whose family I know, I knew, uh, came to me one day and he said, you know, you've got a hobby of history. I got this little notation in this old book that says El Weary, from the north, Newcastle, married a Welsh king named Morgan. So I said, well, that's right, El Weary's the daughter of King Bacoy, and uh, she married Morgan, the son of Arthur II. So he looked at me and said, Arthur who? I said, Arthur II. Because, you see, they were teaching King Arthur in the Welsh schools till 1924, in some cases. And I had a school book of that year, King Tudrig, King Moirig, King Arthur, you know. Well, everybody knew. Uh, Chris Barber up in Crickhall, he had two books, different ones from different schools, telling all about these kings. You see, Wales is not a principality, it's a kingdom. And there were 80 successive kings. So I thought it out, and he said, do you think we could find this guy, Arthur? I said, don't see any problem. They all got notations on where they're buried in the records. Somebody could go and look for him. And that's how we began. The project expanded because it took no time at all to realize that somebody, since around the year 1714, had been very busy abandoning the ancient history of England and Wales. They'd been demolishing it, obliterating it, and getting rid of it. The ancient histories of England and of Wales tell that the first migration into our country took place around 1500 BC. And someone named Albine was sent here from Syria, believe it or not. Well, this was laughed at and jeered at, but the story goes that Albine's daddy is a fellow named Diocletian. And Diocletian had 33 countries or provinces under his rule. And some of his daughters ruled some of these provinces. Also, he had a big enemy named Labana, who caused him great trouble, but Labana finally married one of his daughters. All very so prosaic, can't possibly be true. Throw it out. In 1922 to 34, Leonard Woolley, a magnificent scholar and archaeologist, dug up the necropolis graveyards of the third dynasty of Ur, out in ancient Syria, that area. The third dynasty of Ur was probably the most powerful of an ancient era around this 1500 BC period. And the number one king of the dynasty was none other than Dungi, Diocletian. And Woolley discovered that this guy had ruled 33 provinces. Wow. He also made his daughters rulers in some events. 
But better still, his kingdom was attacked by the first king of the Hittites named Labana. And afterwards, Labana married one of his daughters. Now, the funny thing is, how would the English and the Welsh have this ancient tale, certainly around William the Conqueror's time and earlier, and Woolley digs up the story identically in 1922-34. That makes sense. Uh, the tomb of Diocletian was a palace, two stories above the ground once upon a time, two stories underground, steps going down to it. Nobody heard much about it because at the same time Carter found two clanker moon and the whole thing got swept aside with the euphoria about young King Tut. But in the votive area, religious area, in one of these underground rooms, there was a table of metal, and on it was little reclining bulls and standing ones, and sheep, and orbs, balls. Doesn't sound much. Just before the war, they dug up the Lexton Mound, right? In Colchester. Kin Kinvelin, yellow hair is supposed to be buried there. In the Lexton Mound, they found a Vaudivaria, religious. And there was a metal table, and on it were little bulls and little sheep and balls. They're in the museum in Colchester. Identical. Absolutely spot on identical. Now, when you find this sort of thing, you, you have to have a little thought. Now, maybe there's something in this history. Now, I know that the archaeologists fiddle with the radiocarbon dating, I can come to that later, and they do. Uh, 1939, they found three ships in the Humber, in the mud. And they said, wow, Viking ships, got to be. About ten years ago, somebody had the bright idea of carbon dating some of the wood. Not Viking. The date they came up with was 1550 BC. Now that's about the time that we're getting invaded by these people from Syria, you see. Um, so they had to get out of this one, and they said they're Egyptian ships. They don't look anything like ancient Egyptian ships. Nothing at all. Uh, they've subsequently, I'm informed by Ralph, uh, redated the carbon dating. What the archaeologists are doing, and it's quite illegal and corrupt, they're taking every ancient date before 600 BC dividing it by 80 and multiplying by 100. And they do that to cover up the fact that Egyptian ancient history is in a right old mess. And the dates are wrong. Now, uh, I've written to some of them and said, well, why don't you divide by 95 and multiply by 40? Or why don't you multi <laughs> divide by 67, multiply by 200? You know, why this format? But it's the one that gets them into the right bracket. And you only got to do a few calculations yourself to see how it works. So we were into ancient British history, and we realized we were in a big way. Some of the early historians of the Norman era, William of Malmesbury and Matthew Westminster, about 1130 and 1120, those periods, they made lists of all the people who'd come into Britain over the history. Right? Amongst them, they listed the Ealder Susennas. The Ealder Susennas are the old Syrians. We're back to... Albine again. And they said where they lived. So if anybody ever worried or thought, how did the name Surrey come about? Because you got it. Surrey, Syria. If you read Homer's um, second book, The Odyssey, that's attributed to him, uh, Ulysses comes home from his travels. He meets the bailiff. He's looking after his farm for him. He said, where did you come from originally? He said, I come from a great big island out in the Western Ocean, Britain probably. It's called Syria. So the idea of this Albine thing, it means what I'm trying to get at is our histories are well founded. The second migration into the UK is the Brutus migration. Okay? And Brutus is a great grandson of Aeneas of Troy. Now we've got a problem. Because Brutus is supposed to come here about 150 years after the fall of Troy, he's an old guy, and he arrives in 500 BC. That would make the fall of Troy around 650 BC. And we all know that the Greeks, with their mathematical calculations, they decided the Trojan War took place sometime between 1134 and 1335 BC. 
They don't know quite when. And they got there by mathematical calculation. In Rome, there was a mighty row just before the Christian era because Horace and Virgil and others were saying Roman history starts with Aeneas building the walls of Rome, really, after Romanus, and therefore the Trojan War, 650 BC. The Hebrews thought the Trojan War was 650 BC. Read Josephus. He thinks Moses is around 1700, and he says it's Trojan War 1,000 years after Moses. The Franks had a history of their kings, going back to Antinor of Troy. And there we are, here we go again, 650 BC. Funny thing is that if you read Greek and other histories, they say after the Trojan War, a strange dark period descended upon Greece. No one lived there. No one died there. No one built anything. No one made anything. Nobody lost anything that we could dig up and find. It's Rip Van Winkle land. And suddenly a trumpet blows and everybody's up and running again. There's a 550 year gap. The same gap is appearing. Uh, there's a very fine book written by um, Peter James and four other archaeologists. It's called Centuries of Darkness. And they go right through every single ancient civilization around the Med. And every one of them has got these dark ages and dislocations of 300, 600, 700 years all over the place. The reason is that they tie every history to Egypt. If there's a marriage between a king and his daughter, or if there's a war or a trade agreement, it's always tied to Egyptian dates. And if there's one thing that's well known in historical and archaeological circles, the history of Egypt is a gigantic mess. It's one hell of a muddle. That affects us. It affects us in that it makes a mess and a nonsense of our history, Brutus getting near 500 BC. So they say, oh well, Brutus is a myth, he never existed either. Trojan War never existed, that's the Anglo-Saxon style of view. Then Schleiman goes out to Troy, or Hisselik, uh, 1873, and 1876 he says, this is Troy, Troy now exists. I got a book, 1891, by an Oxford guy, saying Troy never existed, it's a fiction in the mind of Homer. Hang about. They found it years before. But if you can say Troy is a fiction, you see, therefore all British ancient history is founded on a fiction. And this was what they actually did. They, pro they proposed that all our history should be abandoned because it was fictional. We don't agree. I've been into this this way, that way, the other way, 40 different ways. Now, in Wales and in England and in Scotland, there was an ancient alphabet. Right? Julius Caesar describes it. Others mention it. Right? It's said that Marcia, Mar what's him? Amianus Marcellinus said that we got it, the Greeks got the alphabet from the Brits, which actually turns out would be logical. Caesar says it's similar to the Greek alphabet. So, uh, in 1936-7, the BBC, which was the voice of God then, the BBC radio, was the only radio in Britain, there was no TV, and the, the state made damn sure nobody had a private radio, launched a huge campaign, and part of the campaign was the destruction of ancient British history. And they declared that the ancient alphabet was a complete forgery invented in roughly 1800 AD. 200 years ago, Napoleon's time. And the villain of the piece was a fellow named Edward Williams, who was a great copier of old manuscripts. You see, in Britain, manuscripts rot, and they fade, and they get wormwood, and they get damaged in fires, and that, you know. So they kept recopying them down the years. So the Colburn alphabet is taught forgery. Well, that doesn't explain how it's on stones in Scotland, which are confidently dated to around 500 AD which is only 1,300 years before it's forged. It doesn't explain how the Welling Sean wrote down the ciphers of the alphabet in 1550. It doesn't explain why there are stones in England with the Colburn alphabet on it. 1852, 28 feet down, they dug up a stone in St. Paul's Churchyard in London, plastered with it. Can't be right. 
There are stones in Wales, same alphabet. English uh, people who wrote sort of travel itineraries around Britain, various things, they noted several stones. And in the pre-photograph age, they drew pictures of stones in England which had same carbon alphabet. So you begin to wonder what's going on. We decided we'd look at it in some detail. We found a poet who died in 1367 was <laughs> all about the carbon alphabet. We found two others around the 1420, 1425 period, wrote about it, mentioned it, it existed. And another couple in the 1440, 1450 period, we went back 400 years before it's forged. And another couple around 1470. 1582, Rhys Gorch of Alza Street wrote a poem describing and lampooning this ancient carbon alphabet. He'd have a job because if it's written in 1582 and it didn't exist until it was forged in 1800, it, it's something wrong. So we decided the alphabet was genuine. We then discovered that in 1797, a writer said that the British carbon alphabet was identical with the alphabet in Italy, the Etruscan alphabet, which is also in right here, Switzerland. And it was also identical with the Pelasgian alphabet, which means the Aegean and ancient Asia Minor, Turkey. It's identical. Well, someone else wrote this and published it in great detail in 1848 and in 1852. And a second author in 1848, who's the religious type, also said it's identical to Etruscan, it's identical to the Pelasgian in Turkey and the Aegean. Nobody did anything. They'll confidently tell you that every alphabet in the world was tried to read Etruscan. Not true. They didn't try ours. Right? They didn't try ours. So this went on, and in 1906, another person, D. Delta Evans, published again. Here's the alphabet, and it's identical to Etruscan and Pelasgian. So we thought, well, this is odd. Let us take some British inscriptions and see if we can read them because we've got the cipher. So I and Sean wrote it down. That symbol is A, that one's B, that one's C, that one's D. We know cipher. And we also have the Welsh language, 4,000 years old. So we took, this, <laughs> we took some of these inscriptions and we said, well, that's a G, that's a W, that's an E, you know. And out came Welsh words. And we could read the unreadable inscriptions in Britain. So we took little tiny inscriptions in Etruria in Italy. Now there are 14,000 plus inscriptions in Italy and they can't read them. Pliny, writing around the turn of the Christian era, he wrote, be careful, Etruscan is not related to Latin or Greek. So what do they do? They try and translate <laughs> Etruscan as Latin or Greek. Get nowhere. So we took little ones, like on a wine jug, there was an inscription, and it said, drink too much, and you're bandy-legged like a sailor. <laughs> you know, well, I'm 77, and, and when I was a kid, a lot of my old uncles and that had been to sea, you know, and my grandfather had, and, and my great-grandfather was a sailing ship captain, you know. And old sailors, because the ships used to be different to the modern ship, which is pretty stable, they, they used to walk this, you know. <laughs> bandy-legged, I'm not kidding. So anyway, we, there were others, but they all fitted in. And they all made sense. There was a guy who was clearly a defeated gladiator with broken armor and that, and the goddess has got his ar her arm around him. And it, it, the, the inscription matches that scene perfectly. It says how he's getting sucker from the deity, you know. So, you know. And so we knew that we were on a good thing. So we started taking the bigger Etruscan ins inscriptions. They got big stelae, you know, like a tombstone. Those are writing on it. The Etruscans helped us a lot because every few letters they put a dot. That meant word, end of word, you see. So you knew which were words. All you had to find out was if it reads from right to left or left to right. Once you discovered that. Sometimes it reads that way, then that way, then that way. <laughs> Buster Heaton, they call it. So we've now been happily reading unreadable 
indecipherable Etruscan since 1984. We've attempted to tell archaeologists and scholars and linguists they don't even answer your letters. You see, we're not working for a university. Thank God. Um, well, we're not brain dead. Uh, anyway, uh, the point is, most of you are here, and most of the speakers are here, all the speakers are here, because they're free thinkers. They've got a brain that God gave them, and they're prepared to use it. Now, maybe they don't always get it right, but at least they're trying. But in a university, it's like an army. You get people in, some of the top people in the top universities, they're in charge. And they say goes, and if you don't say what they say, you're looking for a promotion elsewhere, or you may be looking for a job elsewhere. And they're too regimental. Well, we decided to move further back, and we went to the Aegean and Turkey, and we found that in 1876, a large inscription had been found on the Isle of Lemnos. Right? And it showed a man with a spear, and there's a inscription, clearly in Colburn. Same alphabet. All over again. So we decided it. It gives a description of people gathering on the island under a leader and they're going to sail to the great green island out in the western ocean. Lemnos, Greece. We, they call it the island of Ligotia in British history, but it's Lemnos. That parallels the gathering of fleets there. That is found in 1876 as well. It's in the Athens Museum and you'll see it. The leader with a spear is Brutus. And that's telling of our ancestors going to sail to the UK. Huh? We then tackled the inscriptions that are scattered through what is now Turkey. And they're all, they're all readable. And they're all readable using Welsh. Cumric. Threat word is Cumric. There's no such nation as the Welsh. It's an old English word, Wallis, meaning strangers. So, you know, let's call us the Welsh. <laughs> By the way, my father's English, my mother's Welsh, my colleague is a Geordie, Geordie, Geordie. So we're not Welsh nationalists, as we've been accused of being. Right? And we found we could read a lot. Um, the sort of thing that happened was we were looking at a magazine one day, and there was a man sitting at a desk, and he's attempting to decipher the copper scrolls found at Qumran. I don't know if you know it, but of all the scrolls that come round, two are on copper, right? And all the others are on papyrus or whatever. And the two on the copper scrolls are not in the same language or alphabet as the others. Professor Kyle MacArthur, who's up in the States, he said that he was going to try and decipher them. He didn't know what the alphabet was, and he didn't know what the language was, but it was Hebrew. And he then said, what has happened? They must have given the copper to be inscribed to some village scribe who was out in a stick somewhere with a local village dialect and wasn't very literate. Now hang about, copper was nearly as expensive as gold and papyrus and that was cheap. So all the clever guys in Qumran are writing on papyrus and some idiot, <laughs> semi-literate, is going to do it on the copper. I said it's very logical, you know, he said well probably is. If you look at the copper scrolls, you'll see something. They were once flat, right? And rolling them up was a mistake, because the only way to unroll them was to cut them in sections, you know? But when laid out flat, you'll see holes a few inches down along the top, holes a few inches up along the bottom. And from each hole, there's a tear, rip. That was once a plate, therefore, nailed onto a wall. And someone has ripped it off the wall. Huh? We know that Solomon put plates of gold on his temple, didn't he? And he put the laws and things on plates of gold and put them on his temple walls. Shishak, the Egyptian, came up at about 930 and he robbed the temple, took it all away. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, didn't have the money to put gold plates back, so he put them up in copper. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Of course, Nebuchadnezzar came along, and he had to go to the temple hundreds of years later. But the point is, somebody may have ripped, may, uh, it's one of my interpretation, may have ripped that off the wall, rolled it up quick, put it under his cloak, and got it out. And that's what it looks like. The point is, 
the writing on the copper scrolls is carbon. I was out in the States, I went to Kentucky, Jim Michael's out there doing the same work as us, <laughs> same things on carbon. There are carbon inscriptions all down the East Coast and up through the Midwest, up the Ohio River, in Tennessee and Kentucky. Carbon everywhere. And you can read it. And he took me one wet evening to a Baptist seminary. Uh, he just drove along, I'm going somewhere. I went with him. It's a Friday night, and we arrived at this Baptist seminary in Ryberry, and we got in. And he said, they've actually persuaded this man, Malik, who's been a Roman Catholic priest of some sort from Poland, sitting on these copper scrolls for 40 years, nobody getting to see him, nobody else getting near him. It's taken 40 years to try and decipher them. But we now had photographs. Well, the photographs must have been taken at 2 in the morning on a very dark night in a thunderstorm. Black and white, I don't know, it's terrible, you know. He clearly didn't want you to see it, you know, he didn't want you to know. But nonetheless, we, we deciphered and read five lines in about an hour and a half. As is only 208 lines, you wonder what Mr. Malik was doing. And again, they do translate into our ancient language, with our ancient alphabet. It's ours. So we're right back there. We had trouble at the time because you've got to realize when we started off, the Iron Curtain was still up, the Berlin Wall was still there, and we wanted to get at the Zagreb Shroud. Somebody had found a mummy wrapped in 32 feet cloth on the outside, huh? about two foot wide, and it was plastered from one end to the other in, have a guess, Colburn writing. And we wanted to see what it said, you see. So we're now back to Egypt. Now, what is coming out of all this is one simple thing. The king of Judea was Ahaziah, Ahaziah, I think it is, around 790. He fought a war with Eden, a little kingdom, one thought he was a big boy. So he then challenges the king of ten tribe Israel. So you've got two tribes Judea, ten tribe Israel. Jehoash is the king there, famous verse in the Bible. You know, the thistle a challenge or wanted the daughter of the great cedar tree for a, a wife. And a bullet came along for a drink and <laughs> trod on the thistle. Uh, it's in the Bible. What it means is you're out of your league, pal. You know, watch it. <laughs> so Ahaziah didn't take any notice. He went up and he fought with Jehoash. His army was annihilated. The guy tied him behind his chariot and dragged him back to Jerusalem. Because his capital Samaria, you see, in Israel. Pulled down 200 yards of the wall. It's in both the Kings and Chronicles in the Bible. It's in Flavius Josephus. He pulls down 200 yards of the wall of Jerusalem. Goes in, takes everything from the palace, you see. And he takes everything from the temple. Now, everything from the temple would include the ark. Right? He also took the family of Obed-Edom. Why did he take them? They're the guardians of the ark. They're 14 times in the Bible. So we said, hey, the ark's gone to Samaria in 790. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> now, it interested us because we translated the Agnoni tablet in Italy, Etruscan. It's a big bronze tablet. The academic view is, uh, they've looked at it, they can't read it, but they think it's a menu of a restaurant. <laughs> now, <laughs> tell it here. Now, a bronze tablet in, we're talking about 500, 600 BC, is immensely valuable. You know, kings had bronze tablets, not restaurants. <laughs> Eat your pizza, you know. <laughs> anyway, it's in three sections. And the first section says the people are in a land where they are not happy. And there's great storms, there's pestilence, and there's all sorts of trouble. So they leave under a chosen leader. And when they leave, they follow a little cabinet that rides in a cart. And they come to a place where they are happy. We think it's Moses leading them out of Egypt. And we think they're landing up in Canaan or whatever. And we think that the little cabinet in the cart is the ark. The second section says that in this happy land, and somebody comes along and disturbs them, and takes them and drags them away to a land where they are unhappy. Dear me. And again, they follow the little cabinet that rides in the cart. 
Well, you've got to remember, one of the kings of Judea paid an enormous sum of cash, enormous sum, to the king of Assyria, Tiglath Pileser III, to persuade him to attack ten tribe Israel, you see? Which he promptly did. Give me the money. <laughs> and he did. And that was Tiglath Pileser III in about 740 BC. He's followed by Shalmaneser IV, Sargon II, and Sennacherib. Each one of them deported huge numbers of people from ten tribe Israel up north, north of Haran towards Armenia. So it's in records. Now, Sennacherib transported 202,020 people in one go. So these are not moving small, they're taking the people away. They moved in other tribes then from Persia, which became Samaria, it became Samaria, no longer ten tribe Israel. So we got the ten tribes of Israel now up north, up north of Haran. And they've followed the little cabinet in the cart. Now the third section of the Agnoli tablet says the people are not happy where they are, they had it. And they decide to move off again. And they move off following the little cabinet riding in the cart. And they go through many lands and they arrive at the sea where they take ship. And come. Well, obviously, if that's the Dardanelles, that's the journey of a people called the Cymry. The Assyrian records call them the Cymry. K-H-U-M-R-Y. Right? They don't spell it in Assyria as the Cymry. In G who is. The Greeks pick up on them as they go through Asia Minor. 650, you know, 7, 780, 687 to, to 650 is the date. When Sennacherib gets murdered in a temple by two of his sons. The other son, Isa Haddon, fights them. There's civil war in Assyria. What a perfect time to take off and shove off, get out of it. And that's what they did. Second book of Esdras, chapter 14, will tell you how they crossed both branches of the Y-shaped Euphrates River. It says so. And they're going west. The Greeks then met them in, or knew of them in Turkey, Asia Minor, called them the Kimari. They were really a menace. Everybody saying, oh, they come to all keep, <laughs> let them in, get them out, keep them going. <laughs> no, I don't know. There's too many of them, you see. And half of them go to Etruria. That's in Herodotus. Half of a nation goes to Italy, to Etruria. The other half stayed there, to about 500. And then they come to the UK. Now, we knew if that little box that rides in a cart is the ark taken from Jerusalem, not south by little baby Menelik in his caddy shop, Ethiopia, it was, went north, right? And if it went north and it went to that and else, it either went to Italy, Etruria, or it came to the UK. Didn't it? What's a grail? Spell a grail. G-R-E-A-L. The proper spelling. Manuscript of 1106, Earth St. Grail. Sixth year of Henry the First. A St. Grail, big manuscript. That's where Mallory took his stuff, purloined lumps of it to write the moth out. He didn't take all of it, he just took bits. It's in, it's not in English. <laughs> it doesn't let us there. So, if you're looking for a Grail, if you look in the 1688 Welsh Dictionary, you'll find a Grail is a valuable document. The Magna Carta is a Grail. American Declaration of Independence is a Grail. Uh, the Talmud would be, be a, grail, a grail. The Koran would be a grail. The Bible would be a grail. Any Magna Carta, as I said, King John, it's a grail. That's what you're looking for. If you've got a holy grail, it's a guess on our part. We think it's the tablets of Moses where he wrote the Ten Commandments. And they're inside the ark. Right? Didn't think I was going to talk about this, did you? Right. Cardiff and the valleys up there on there always had a legend, and the legend is, was known to me when I was a young kid, in the 30s now. Everybody said about it, it was just a local story. There's a great big box somewhere, a wooden box, and inside this wooden box is a great treasure. And the box is guarded by what they, in Welsh, to Kig Van Goa, which means flesh-eating crows, ravens. A cherubim of all time wasn't a, no wasn't a nice little angel. He was a fearsome dragon beast with a wings, you see. So, 
it's not difficult to see the great box as a wooden box. Is the ark is a wooden box. And it's not difficult to see the two cherubim placed on the gold top of the ark with their wings outspread. You see Raiders of the Lost Ark in Indiana Jones, that sort of thing. And it's not difficult to say, well, that might be the ark. And so we set out to find the ark. Not difficult, actually. Um, <laughs> oh. All over South Wales, uh, Glamorgan Gwent, there are huge mounds, mainly on hilltops. Huge earth mounds, I mean really big earth mounds, size this room. Some are small. And my colleague said to me one day, he said, uh, Alex, what's that one up there, you know? And I said, he, he said, a, a bloody, I, I said, a bloody head. Oh, I said, that's a ferocious warrior. And sometimes a penny drops, doesn't it, you know? We'd already learned, ignore the Greeks, ignore the Romans. You want to find something out, ancient Arab, ancient Hebrew, ancient Egyptian names. The ancient Arabs, Hebrews, and Egyptians called the star constellation Hercules a ferocious warrior. And a penny was dropping, oh boy, because over to the other direction is Tumbalu, the he-goat, Capricorn. And over the other way, we had a very big boat ship on the top of the hill, and that was spot on for the great constellation of Argo. Now, if you've got two or three stars, you can triangulate and find a pole star. Am I right? So we did, and so it's, a, it's a standing stone. And from there, we found all these big mounds, they're all named and located for stars, the major stars in the heavens. So you've got a star map on the ground. They go on about the Nazca drawings, don't they, in Peru. We've got something better and bigger. We've got huge mounds stayed up, a gigantic star, map of the stars, mounds. Just outside Cardiff on the, on the Garth Mountain, there's two big ones and one little one. <laughs> it's right to the belt of Orion, down in Morgan's Snow Below, big one in the woods. And you can find the four outlying stars of Orion. You come across the way in Cardiff, houses built all around it. Taurus, big mound. Another one on the other side of Cardiff, on top of the hill. Aries are up, and you go on the Capricorn. And they're everywhere. And that's how you get after the ark. All you've got to do is find Regulus which is the biggest of the lot. Uh, you see, we said Regulus, because uh, Regulus star is the star in, biggest star in Leo, the lion. And Leo the lion is the emblem of Judea and Jerusalem. So we thought there's a good chance that that's it. It's a man-made mound, about four acres of it, 60 feet high, all man-made, on top of another hill. Someone in antiquity built a stone wall around the top. Huh? No gates. Why did they do that? Why would they build a stone wall on the top of a Welsh hill? I do not know. But the inside area is called Golug, which means place of worship. And the whole mound is on its abil. On its enclosure of, or special area of, uh, the, and then it's, if you've got BWL, it's special place. If it's BYL or BIL, it means ark. There are four sumps on the north side, like big hollows in the ground. In the bottom are pits with white stones in them, right? The way they drained ancient chambers in Britain underground is they had a sump in the bottom of the chamber and they ran a little shaft, a tunnel down the hillside. And where it would then come out the hillside, it made a little tick, so it came up into the bottom of one of these bowls. They have been excavated elsewhere. So water in the, would run down into the chamber, be bled off down the shaft. It wouldn't rush out and do damage. It would come up in the tick. And there were these white stones filling up these 18-inch circular things in the bottom of the curved sump. Like, it's like a saucer upside down, you know, sticking in, in the, uh, a bowl. Perfectly made. The thing is, no weeds ever grew on these stones. So we got a sample and found there were three different sorts. One of our lads took them to the museum and other places. They turn out to be stones that can only be found in Cornwall, 300 miles away. So we know there are at least four underground chambers there. And we got our lad from London. We have one of the world experts, fortunately, 
the first guy who was ever able to um, detect metal underwater. And he'd been out in Oz in Australia, and then he was gold mining, and then he was out in Arizona, but he came back and he wanted to meet us. We got home. He's got a metal detector that reads down 30 feet, and it'll tell you if it's ferrous or non-ferrous. There is an object there, two feet by four feet, and it's non-ferrous metal. That's as far as we got with that one. Anyway, to revert to King Arthur. Interesting story, isn't it? The Empress Helen brought the cross back from Jerusalem. Do you know that? It's in all our histories. It's in 25 different histories across the world. It's in the Exeter book, which is Saxon. The Empress Helen, the mother of Constantine the Great, she goes to Jerusalem on a pilgrimage. She went to the pilgrimage on Sinai, the steps of Moses, and she went to Jerusalem and said, I want the cross. And of course they hummed and hawed and hiffed and hooked. And she narrowed it down from about 120 of them to about 50 of them. She got it down to about 10. She finally got the one guy. And she put him in a dry well. And no food, no water. And she wasn't going to let him out until she told her where the cross was. So he realized the game was up and he told her where the cross was. <laughs> she got the nails, made a bridal bit for her son Constantine, sent him up for his horse, you see, so he got the cross. Nails. And she plastered the cross with gold and jewels, put it in a silver casket, got into the ships, and brought it back to the UK. If you go to Wales, you'll find a little field. The field of the cross. The road of the cross, ten miles further on. The pass of the cross. The veil of the cross. The wood of the cross. It goes all around the country like that. See, when these potentates, kings and that, traveled, they didn't leave any loot behind them in the palace or nothing, or the court, they don't know. They took everything with them in ox carts. So the wagon train would go about eight to ten miles a day. That's what's happening. She paraded it around the country. And she finally put it in Constantinople. Any takers? No? Which Constantinople? You see, there's a little hamlet in West Wales called Constantinople. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nearby is Castel Ethlin Bauer, the castle of the great Ellen. And then there's Alan Bannon, the river of the Empress. And there's Kevin Bannon, the bridge of the Empress. And there's more and more and more. So we were on the track of the cross. We know where it is. Edward I wanted it. He said to the Welsh, I want the cross. And I also want the iron crown of King Arthur. And they wouldn't give it to him. There's a sealed cave, and we've put the old magic machine on it again. <laughs> and there is an object there about four to five feet long and by a foot by a foot, and it's non-ferrous metal. We think that matches the silver casket that she put the bit of cross in. Okay? So that's the sort of thing that we do. This is how we go about it, and that's what we do. Arthur is two kings, right? Firstly, Christianity arrived in the UK in 37 AD. Who says so? Well, Cardinal Baronius and Cardinal Alford, the official historians of the Catholic Church, around 1530, they said so, which alarmed the Bishop of Rome. He set out to ask some questions. He didn't like the answers. Also, the British writers, Gildas, 6th century, Nennius died 822. They both say Christianity in the UK. They say the last year of Tiberius, which is 37 AD. The Holy Family arrives in the UK. Now, believe it or not, a multitude of ancient Welsh and English princes claim descent from intermarriage with the Holy Family. Multitude, not one or two. I uh, made a few photo stats. I don't usually bother, but I better get something to prove it. Um, here we go again. Let's see if I got some here. The point, the point being that Arthur, of course, is a member of these holy families. By the way, there's one. The most famous, uh, one, some of the most famous manuscripts, uh, is the Life of Saint Caddoc, sixth-century saint. And at the beginning, it says, "Virgin Mary, belly, son of the Virgin Mary, brother of, Na of Jesus of Nazareth," and then Abelach, Balathad goes on. So he's claiming descent from a brother of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, 
The most famous manuscript that we've got in the UK is probably the Harleian 3859. And in it are the genealogies that were collected for a wedding of the Prince Owen, son of Holdar, around 920. The manuscript was recopied, I think, about 1100. Um, and it lists all his ancestors. There's about 30 odd lists, you see, because you can link back into different families as you go further back to marriages and intermarriages. See? But nonetheless, it says here that uh, his Owen and his father Hegel, Howell and Caddle and so on. Uh, at Amlech, there is an extraordinary note which says, Amlech, the son of Beli the Great, and Anna, his mother, who they say was a cousin of the Virgin Mary. It's, they've got different ideas of it, but it's there all the time. Uh, it's repeated in list after list, manuscript after manuscript, with different connotations. Uh, the same manuscript goes on about Masengletic, Magnus Maximus, and his descent from Constantine the Great. Magnus Maximus was the only son of Crispus Flavius Nobilis Caesar. He was the only son of the first marriage of Constantine the Great with Minerva, a British princess. Huh? And therefore he's the eldest son of Constantine. So you've got the only son is Magnus, Crispus, Crispus the eldest son of Constantine the Great. Now Magnus is a great British ancestral figure. So he came back to Britain and his descendants are multitudinous. His eldest son was Arthur the first, the son of his first wife, Coindrech, daughter of Ryden. It's all written down, it's there. Now this is the Arthur in history who invades Gaul with the armies in 383. They invaded France. The Romans were kicked out of Britain, by the way, in 322 by King Eudar. They weren't in Britain. They were in and out of Britain like the bishop in the proverbial brothel. You know. The Roman, this idea of 400 years of Roman rule has to be Mickey Mouse. It's a joke. It has no truth whatsoever. And once you start reading these histories, you realize it's, you've been fed up. We've been fed a load of old baloney. Are they taking us for a ride? Anyway, Magnus Maximus is his daddy, and they invade France in 383 with an army of reputedly 60,000 men. So they've got a big fleet. Uh, the other records say 37,000. They besiege Paris under the Lady Saint Genevieve, <laughs> Guinevere. And there's a mosaic in the Modena Cathedral, about 1100, showing the siege of Paris by Arthur and his men, and that is Arthur I. Gratian, the Emperor of Rome, comes up and they fight at Soissons. The, our records say call it the Battle of Sassy at Soissons, 12 miles south of Paris, and Gratian is defeated by our lad, Arthur, and he chases him down to Lyons, invites him to the supper and kills him. So Magnus becomes Emperor of the West. Arthur proceeds to Switzerland, and he goes down on the cathedral to Italy. In Taranto, there's a mosaic of him riding on a goat. Crossed over the Balkans, he fought two huge battles then with the Emperor of the East, Theodosius. One at Poitovio and the other at Sisica on the Sica River. Well recorded. Huh? Now the reason I'm going into this a little bit is that we're going to get someone in a minute. He comes back to the UK because Magnus gets surprised at Ravenna and is killed. Uh, one of his half-brothers is Victor, who was the Augustus of Gaul in Paris. He gets killed and uh, apparently comes back to the UK. And he has sons and presumably daughters. In the year 406, which is not long after this 383 to 388 effort, 20 years, the Vandal Confederation invaded Gaul. The Swaves, the Alans, and the Vandals, and they smashed up Gaul, which is why the Vandals gave their name to Vandalism. Roman army was cut to pieces, couldn't do anything with them. British wanted to keep them away from the coast, so they elected Constantine, a cousin of Arthur, to be king. And this war king takes the British army, which doesn't exist according to the English, across to English academics, across to Gaul, and they promptly smashed up the Vandals, the Swaves, and the Alans. And they penned them in south of France against the Pyrenees, and Geraint, the general, blocked the passes of the Pyrenees. Honorius is in Rome, pointing his fingernails, don't know what to do. The British king sat in Treves, and he didn't know what to do. And his generals are saying, 
get out the Horonorius, get him, you know, go kill him, and there was murder. He, he, wouldn't, he was dithering. Anyway, Alaric the Goth saw the opportunity, so he invades Italy. And did he cause havoc? He ransacked every city, including Rome, you see. Now, he passes by Rome and he's heading south. Honorius writes a letter. And the letter is to the citizens of the city of Regium in the province of Britium, yeah, which is the toe of Italy. And he says, Alaric's on his way. He's coming, and there's nothing I can do. Get on your own. Do you know the English academics in Oxford, Cambridge, and that have persuaded people for hundreds of years that Honorius writes this letter to Britain and tells the helpless British, you're on your own? Hang about, the British king is running France and Britain and has just kicked the daylights out of these big Germans. And you'll see that in book after book, these poor helpless British, dependent on the Romans, get a letter from Honorius. It did read Limpidorius and Zosimus, the historians, the letter didn't come to Britain, it went to the Tor of Italy. You're on your own, Alaric's come in. Yeah, have they lied to us? Because that is a blatant lie. And you can read it in many books. We won't help us at all. I digress. <laughs> okay, Arthur I has a son, Tathal, Theodore. He has a son, Tithra in the Subtle, who's left his name on a font, right? And Tithra in the Subtle uh, has a son, Tithvald, who is Theodosius, right? Tithvald becomes king of Britain after the great massacre which killed most of the royal family. He becomes king. His son is Tudric, King Theodoric. He's killed in the fighting at the Ford of Tintin, as in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and in the Welsh Records, in 508. Well, he's severely wounded. They took him away. He wanted to be buried on Echdy, an island in Cardiff Bay. And it was at Tintin. They brought him down the river Wye. Couldn't go far. He's on a cart in Rome. And they got to a well, and he died there. That is still Tintin as well. And there's black there saying this is where he died. He's Arthur II's grandfather. He's buried in the church nearby, they just put him down and they built a church over him. Been excavated in 1618 and, uh, 1617 I think, and 1881. There's a skeleton with a big wound in the skull. So he's there. Now if you can find Arthur's grandfather, it'd be a bit odd if you can't find him. You see where, where is he going? Arthur's father was found in Myrig, which is Morris. We know where he's buried. It's clearly stated. Then you come to Arthur II, this mysterious non-existent king. Do you know there are more accounts of his grave and burial than you could fill a sack with? It's the most glorious, well-known, well-advertised funeral you ever heard of in the Dark Ages. All 182 mayors of the different areas of Britain, they have mayors, attend. <laughs> He's kept in a cave while they're digging and getting everything ready. You go to the cave. There are two accounts there, one in Nennius, one in the Knife of Italy. The boat comes up the Oweni River, body's in the boat, there's a stone on it. They take the body out of the boat, they put it in the cave. You go in that cave, there's a big pit, and it's very hard rock. It's cut about 11 feet long, about well, three or four feet wide, four feet deep. That's where they put him while they're making ready. There's actually an inscription on the wall covered with stalagmite, saying, this is where he is. It is there. And that was found accidentally by Colin Games and Blair Urquhart, two filmmakers. They panned across the wall, you see, looking for spiders. There's loads of strange, rare spiders there. And they got this inscription. Anyway, so we know all about Arthur first, we know all about Arthur second. Uh, the only mystery is why is that a mystery? I don't know. There's no mystery at all. Now, the other thing they'll tell you is uh, this Geoffrey Ash, the Canadian, was into this. I have searched every map and every part of Britain and I cannot find the Battle of Baden site, famous battle, and I can't find the Battle of Camlan. Can't find it anywhere. That's a bit odd really, because if you get an ordnance survey map, <laughs> as the government tells them, you'll find the army gathering ground is still there, down at uh, Ogmore, and uh, the army gathers at noon, the young man drives across the water, uh, the, the, to join the king, and he doesn't recognize the king, so he splashes him <laughs> in water. He gets a whack for that. And these stories are there, and they decide at 9 o'clock they'll go up 
to Baden for the battle. The road going up the Maestad Valley is for the Gavraith, the road with the tumult. And you get there, and on the Alderman's survey map, it says Mullet Baden. Baden Mountain. Can't find it. The battle area, I went to Mrs. Giffey's school, and the farmer said, Would you mind if I have a look around it? She said, Well, you can go anyway, because there's a right away through it. I said, Well, I'd like to walk all around it, you know, it's your land. Oh, yeah. Said, big battle up there after the Romans. Really big battle up there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The fields are named Moist Cad Lower, Field of Battle Area. You know, and it's called Money Baden. And there's the Dell of Chastisement. And the local blacksmith remembered all the local folklore in about 1870, so he wrote a little book and drew diagrams to preserve it. And where the army was stationed and how they did it. Because it had been passed on the century. Now, apparently, they can't find a battle of Camelan. None of them. They don't know where Camelan is. It's two battles, actually. Arthur brings the army back from Brittany. They're going to land at Longborth. Where's Longborth? Nobody knows. West Wales, nice big sandy beach. You could bring 50, 60 ships in together. Right? It's like a D-Day battle, because it's described in the epic poetry like a D-Day battle in the surf, you know? And the Prince Geraint gets mortally injured. That's the sad bit. The Arthur gets his army ashore. The farm on the promontory there it's called Longborth Farm. There's a prince, Bledry is killed in a fighting. Well, just a mile in, and in the field there's a big stone, it's got Bledry written on it. Three miles inland, Geraint takes three days to die. They send to Brittany for a coffin for him. There's Bathe Geraint Farm, Grave of Geraint Farm. And it's a whacking big grave on. Well, I had to find, you know. If you go inland and say, where's the old main road? out of here, because Modred is now fleeing from his uncle. I thought it was after him. These are real guys. Get your Alderman survey map. To the east of Dolgethley, Camlan Mountain and Camlan Valley. Same thing. Little winding valley, ideal place to try and stop someone with a small number of men, bottle them up, you know, like a bottleneck. What's the villagers say? Oh, yes. Started down there, it did, you know. It took three days to get through. They know all about it. Of course, Oxford and Cambridge think that Wales is on the dark side of the moon. Uh, actually, we're not, like, you know. When I say we, just the Welsh half of the talk, you know. <laughs> sometimes they're Welsh, sometimes they're English. You have to forgive me, I'm a Brit. But the point I'm making is none of these things or places are hard to find. They're harder to miss than they are to find. Now, there are about 200 stones in Wales of ancient kings. BBC made a programme, you know, on the king, Emperor Carosius. Have you heard Carosius? Anybody? No? There was a triple, often there were two and three emperors ruling together. No, Diocletian had a co emperor named Maximinius, Maximanius, or something like that. But there was a third one in the triumvirate, Carosius. So they ruled a chunk of the empire each around, we're talking about the 270, 280 period, right? Carosius is a British king, Carol, and he ruled Britain and Gaul, and he's known as the Admiral, he had a big fleet, which stopped any of the other two getting at Britain, you see. Now, the joke is, BBC Time Watch said, there is no trace whatsoever of Carosius in Britain. So I wrote them a letter, and I said, what do you make of the tombstone of Carosius, found at Pen Macno with his name on it? <laughs> it's in the Commander Museum. I had a really hot letter back. No one else has complained about our program. Well, he wouldn't bloody know. <laughs> you know, it's hot stuff, isn't it? So, you know, there are names of these kings all over stones. Now, my colleague bought a little group of papers, crumbling papers in a bookshop. He used to go around all the old bookshops, buying old books and ferreting about. And there was some very good old second-hand bookshops down there at the time. One was brilliant. He bought these papers to give the guy a tenor. And in it, John Strange from England, from an antiquarian society in London, has gone into the darkest Africa of Wales to see if he could find Roman remains. So he goes around Glamorgan and Brecon, and he's terribly disappointed. He can't find hardly any Roman remains. Be lucky if he did, because giraffes don't live in the North Pole. The Romans were hardly ever there. Right? Now, when well, they were there as prisoners, they had a going rate, how much you paid for Roman legionary for a slave. Fact. 
Anyway, in this thing, he did find something he found interesting. It's a, a sort of eight feet high stone, narrow one. The top is floral, right? The middle is a king, and he's holding a scepter in one hand, a sword in the other, and on the bottom is an inscription. It's in the alphabet that wasn't invented till 1800. And it says, Godufan the Exile. It's interesting, because Godufan was a king around the year 200. And he was exiled because he was a turbulent and drunkard. And it says, God do from the exile. Now that really woke us up to reality. You know? Here we go. And, and he's terribly disappointed. This guy. He, he interprets this. He says, this must be a Viking king. <laughs> a Viking king in Wales in the 6th century. The Vikings were never in Wales. Well, they did. They did come there twice. They lost their fleet and the entire army got trapped on an island, a flat home in Cardiff Bay. <laughs> so they weren't too successful. So this sort of thing is happening all the time, you see. And it's constant negativity, 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 negativity. It's like a drip, drip, drip. Now instead of having nothing or confusion, we have a magnificent history in great detail, remarkably accurate, and it belongs to us, all of us, all right? You can't find King Lud of London. Yes, you can. He's peppered through the Welsh records, isn't he? Yeah? That he recorded the English and the Welsh lines of kings. Lud of London was real. One of his sons is in the Songs of the Graves. And he's in the Songs of the Graves because he's fighting as a warrior, you know? His grave mound is said where it is, and you can go along the banks of the Thames, I think it's Berkshire. His grave mound is still there. But if his son is real, Lud is real. King Coyle of Colchester, father of Helen of the Cross, who are real people, he's a descendant of Lud. Lud kicked Caesar's backside and threw him out of Britain. He did. What he did, Caesar invaded the second time, found it dead easy. Matter on the bank of the south bank of the Thames, nobody stopped him. Crossed the Thames, no problem. Got up towards St Albans and he said, hey, We've come all this way, there's no food and no cattle, because the Roman army depended on what it could find, where it went. All the people have been taken away, all the cattle have been driven away, and they'd burnt the crops. Then he had the bad news. There's a British army blocking the Thames, the ford you came across. There's another British army attacking your fleet. It's in the records. So Caesar thinks, hang on, I'm in the middle of any enemy territory, I've got no grip. The British king had sent his army home for the winter. He sent them home for the winter. And he had 4,000 chariots stationed around Caesar's sort of beleaguered force, preventing them from getting at any food. Because they'd have to go in groups foraging for food, and they, these fast moving charioteers, they'd sort, they'd sort them out. The folklore story is that uh, Caswallan, uh, Caswallan means the viceroy, sent to Caesar and said, hey, come for supper. <laughs> you know, you'd agree. And he suggested that he go home. So Caesar went home surrounded by the British Army. So the English academics say this was a sign of respect for the Romans acting as an escort. By hell it was. It was making sure they got out of Britain as fast as they could without doing any more damage. Get them out. The description in Caesar's Gallic Wars is they piled the soldiers onto the ships, three times more soldiers per ship than they normally would. It's like the British withdrawal from Dunkirk and the American organized withdrawal from Vietnam. So you gone. They were battered. Ludd built a triumphal arch in London. He built the city of London, you see. It's, well, that's what the British records say. He built a remarkable city on the bank of Thames. He built a triumphal arch. About ten years ago, archaeologists found the remains of a triumphal arch at Ludgate. Must be Roman. Hang about, what, how did Lud come to build it? Oh, it must be Roman. Everything they find, you find one stone on top of another, it's Roman. I'm telling you, it, you, it, when you, if you do this, how myself and my colleague have not become totally infuriated and mad with this. There are 12 ancient Roman records of Druids. This gives them an idea of Druids. Eleven of the records are about the Druids of the south of France, and one is dubious, maybe Britain or not. He didn't know anything about Britain. Huh? Large numbers of Roman emperors had British queens as wives. 
numbers of Roman emperors were British. They don't tell you that. Very often the Roman Empire was split into two or three. It's not, it wasn't just one empire going on. And they had Western emperors in the 320, 350, 348 era. Western emperors. Three of them have left their gravestones in Glamorgan. They say, oh, it must be a Roman milestone. Hang on, there's no Roman road. It doesn't say how many miles from where to where. <laughs> it just says a guy, you know. Uh, Udaf, who kicked the lieutenant of Constantine the Great out in 320, 322, is a grandson of the Emperor Victorinus. Huh? How are you working out? We've been told bullshit in large doses. And this is why the establishment love us so much. They really like myself and my colleagues. We're at top of their Christmas card list. <laughs> well, we're not going to give up. We're not going to stop. We've written um, eight books so far, banging down the information, the Arthur conspiracy, because we go into detail. We don't just generalize. We, we stick it to them. You know? And we've written something on the hieroglyphs. We can read the Egyptian hieroglyphs. Did I say that? Well, <laughs> Professor Sir John Morris Jones in 1896, he wrote the thesis and he said, all the syntax and the construction of the language of ancient Welsh is the same as Egyptian. So we said, hang about, we know that the ten tribes are the Cymri in Britain. We know that they were in Asia Minor, same alphabet. We know they were in northern, southern Armenia and Assyria. When Austin Layard dug up 25,000 tablets of the archives of the emperors of Assyria at Nineveh, he sent them off to London. He got them in London, they said, oh look, some of these are in the old British alphabet. Let's do nothing about that. <laughs> Let's do nothing, anyway. So they're called the Cymri. They're still called the Cymri all the time, you see. And these excavations that have gone on since the 1800s and modern century, they're giving evidence, evidence, evidence that what our ancestors told us and recorded for us is right. Yeah? We're not a group of barbarian peasants sitting in mud huts. What happened? 562, Britain and parts of Ireland were devastated by a comet. Definitely. It's in the records. That's how in the Arthurian legends you get the great wastelands. Places where you can't go and you can't live, you die. Nothing lives. No birds, no reptiles, no plants. Dead land. For seven to eleven years, Arthur the first, second, what he did, he immediately evacuated the army to Brittany. Got it out. Well, he knew he'd need it to get back. Because in those days, other countries didn't send help. They came over to rob what they could. Right? So he's over in Brittany. He comes back. This is where he fights this longboat battle on the beach, you see? And calm down, because his nephew's trying to take over while he's away. This is how the Angles and Saxons got into Britain. They're coming into depopulated, devastated, but recovering lands with very few people in most areas and certainly not much opposition. So the Anglo-Saxon conquest makes sense. You see, otherwise they're saying three boatloads of Saxons or Dukes under Hengist conquered 10 million people. These Brits must have been weak. They'd only been kicking the daylights out of the Roman Empire for a while. And it's the 562 Comet is the answer to a lot of it. Now, we've been mocked and laughed at. Professor Victor Klug, astrophysics professor, <laughs> Oxford University, he agrees Comet hit Britain. But his colleagues went <laughs> at him, see? Professor Bailey, Michael Bailey, a dendrochronologist in Queen's University, Belfast, he finds now all the trees of Britain and Ireland were all forests, were all burned. Right across. Gregory of Tours says, at the same time, he's French, right? Let's see the facts. All the forests of the two islands in the ocean, Britain and Ireland, are ablaze. Huh? Of course, this is all disbelieved. It's not suitable, because the Church of Rome said, no stone can ever fall from heaven upon earth. Pope says so. So when in 1457, I think it was, a meteorite nearly hit one of the big potentates out in the Balkans, that was discounted. But they had to give in in 1803 or 4, 
when a large shower of meteorites hit parts of southern France. And they had to admit, yeah, things can fall from him. The funny thing is, American academics from Austin University, Texas, from State University, Southern State, I think, Pennsylvania, and certainly from the Chicago Museum, they're all digging up Bolivia. Because all the temples, the pyramids, all the towns built of mud brick, villages, everything, was destroyed. And most of the population were destroyed in 562 by a comet. Now the Brits knew it came from the north, east, going southwest. You get yourself a globe on a map, draw a line, and you go right through Bolivia. And this date is the same, 562. Now we got an American professor, she's uh, an astronomer and other things in New York University. She's with us because she's finding traces of this cometary debris towards Australia. Straight line. So if it hit Bolivia, why didn't it hit Britain? Because it's come that way. Of course it hit Britain. That's what all our records say. But you mustn't read those records because they're all forged. The theory is that for 1,500 years, about 2,000 writers, bards, chroniclers and all, they all got together and they made this gigantic, gigantic interlocking forgery. And they put it all together neatly. One of these writers was a king. And they made this huge forgery. And they tried to flash that off on the unsuspecting public. What public? I don't know. Now, the theory itself is a nonsense. You know, actually, we, we collectively, are not up against clever people. Or we're not against hard-working people. Because I know that everybody's come on this platform has worked bloody hard at what he does. We're up against scallywags, time servers, who are looking for their next rung on the promotion ladder. Not to say anything, even if they believe it, because they don't want to be out of a job or out of favour. And this is the way things go. Academia works like that. Now, it doesn't take a genius to see that if somebody descends from Yestin Ab Gurgen or Morgan, the last king in 1300, Wales is a kingdom, that makes the Prince of Wales look like Charlie. So you've got Yestin Ab Gurgen, 14 sons, he had brothers who had sons, all their descendants kept their records, they're gentry, you see. There's people walking on the day, we can trace back to him. If you trace back to Justin, you're back to Arthur II, you're back to Arthur I, you're back to Constantine the Great, and you are back to Brutus, the first king. So when they amalgamated, actually they annexed Wales to England, none of the Welsh lords were allowed in the House of Lords. When they joined England and Scotland, the Scots lords went into the House of Lords. When they joined Ireland into England and Scotland, the Irish peers and lords went into the House of Lords, but not the Welsh. Because okay? it's a pecking order thing. Huh? Now it's making sense. So you've got two King Arthurs, one descended from the other, one's 6th century, one's late 4th century, one does attack the Romans, one does deal with the Saxons and the Angles. That's why when Polydor Virgil, he was the historian for Henry VIII, the six wives, he said, look, you know, this art of figures is ridiculous, he's 250 years old. You know? And a Welsh vicar said, yeah, but he's two people. And the Reverend Williams in North Wales wrote a book on it. Yeah. 1734. So it's always been known that he was two people. No. Glastonbury Abbey in Somerset, we better deal with it. Let's bury it. Glastonbury Abbey in Somerset was founded in 940. The first abbot was Dunstan, St. Dunstan, in 941. And it was a little building which they have since discovered, the later abbey was bigger and it was built as a mortuary chapel for some of the uh, English kings. Huh? And how they can persist with that one, God only knows. Some of the Welsh kings used to retire when they were old and go to live in Cornwall. Didn't it? You see, when you get to about 70, they say, about, I've done a lot of bad things. I, I had this woman and I murdered him and I assassinated that one. You know? And um, I'll go and be a priest. So they hand the king, they hand the kingdom over there, and they get them say they're going to join the church. You see, then they, you got to, you're ill, your Majesty. I think you've had it, right? Well, baptize me. They get baptized in the old thing, 
because then the only sins that they take to heaven with them are the ones they commit after they baptize. baptized. You don't get in a lot of sexual trouble on assembly, I tell you. <laughs> and, yet you, and if you're retired from active politics, you're not going to bother killing anybody. <laughs> and that's what they did. You see, they retired. That's how Chudri gets killed at the Ford at Tindon. He's retired. He's going to be living in a little chapel. You know, see it out. And the Saxons invade. Then they're trying to run away from Morris, Morris's son, and the army. So he blocks the Ford. They can't get across the Ford to get out. And then the, so the Saxons are trying to get out, get across the Ford. He's stopping them. And the Welsh army's coming up behind him. And uh, they, were, they all got caught in a voice, as it were. But if you look at these things sanely and read the records, now all that I and my colleagues do, and I promise you this, we only read the records. If it's not in the record, we don't put it in the book. If it's not on a piece of parchment or on a stone tablet or inscribed on a jug, or on a grave or whatever, it doesn't go in a book. If the site isn't there on the map and you can't go and stand in it, it doesn't go in the book. Right? We're not interested in extrapolating or interpreting and speculating. We're not bothered. We have made mistakes in our research. Be weird if we didn't have to, you know, this sort of... It's a seminal work. Nobody else is bothered for 10, 100, years, 100 years at least. And so we always admit the mistake. If we've made a mistake, later but we'll say, we got that wrong. And it's the right way to go. Uh, Christianity was in, in Britain, that's clear. We found that one of the great mess-ups of uh, the last century is the famous Songs of the Graves, where it names the grave place of some of the illustrious people of ancient Britain, right? Crude and Brutus. Brutus is not supposed to exist. There's a full statue of Brutus, dated at least 500 BC, in Rome, with an inscription around the base, which is in Alburn writing. He doesn't exist. He's got a grave, right? Um, and the Reverend uh, Robert Williams, I think, yeah, he decided he would do this job of deciphering, translating the Songs of the Graves. He did it for Skeen, who wanted it, Skeen as a customer, wanted to publish all British records. And he said, there's 183 very brief mentions in the Songs of the Graves of ancient princes and kings. And they're all so brief, you can't find any. W. H. Thomas, in 18, 1958, gave the Reese Memorial Lecture, and he said, be careful, there's less than 70 names, and there's a bit more information on them. So we took this, and we said, we'll do it as we always do. Word one, look it up. Word two, look it up. We do one word at a time. We don't pretend. Even if we've seen that word two lines before, we still look it up in a dictionary. And I can speak a bit of Welsh, so I got all levels in Welsh, but not in school. And I go to a Welsh school and I got evacuated the answer the bomb. Anyway, <clears throat> we looked at the Songs of the Graves. There's 23 names of people buried and where they are. So instead of 183, vague notices as 23 detailed notices and you can find them so concealed forever is the grave of Arthur I can't wait it says a bad exposed place so be it is the grave of Arthur second line says it's a narrow place damp place and a very windy place you see he says El Huith is a prince he's buried somewhere L is extremely, and Huith is windy. It's a very windy place. It is, it's 900 feet up on the mud hill. And he made a complete mishmash. You've got two whole verses on Arthur. They even named the field. Tithe maps will say, they draw a big map, and they put a number in each field. And in a tithe book alongside, it goes number one, two, three, four, five, down the book. Field number one, who acreage, right? Who owns it? Who tenants it? How much you got to pay the church every year at tight, right? And then in Wales, the name of the field. Every field had a name. You get the old tithe maps, you can read the history of the country on the fields. The field of slaughter, the field of the quarrel, the field of the beer tent, and all this, you know. They can tell you what went on. And so, we were able to read these things in some detail and go there. The key one is the grave of Eli Nair, the son of Nair. 
uh, is stretched out on a plank, crucified, brutally treated, etc. Eli is holy and Ne is Lord God. So you've got the grave of the Lord God, the holy Lord God, the Son of God who was crucified and badly treated. And it tells you exactly where he's buried. And I did say the Holy Family came into Britain in 37 AD, didn't I? Mm. So we got another bunch down our necks. I don't think the Bishop of Rome is going to like it. Yeah. Tough. Because we're going to keep printing it. Any questions? Is it? Yes. Uh, we've been looking for place names. It appears to be a scatter of debris, and we find a number of places have got uh, mud. It seems to be associated with a lot of mud. And there is one place which says there's a cleft in the ground because of this thing. There is one such place. We, so we, we found it was too big a task for us. We needed more people to do, you know, more troops on the ground. We didn't have them. But we did have a go at finding a way and in what direction. Um, we were able to find uh, some places were not touched by it, obviously. It, it didn't destroy everything. But it, it seems that some valleys places would have escaped, you see? Because they were a bit concealed. But it, it definitely would have smacked into North Wales, definitely. And Powys and those areas, and it would have. It would have cleaned out England. So, yeah, we did have a go at finding it. And, of course, the problem in England is all the place names have changed. They've been anglicised. And because they were destroyed, then the incoming people, the Angles and Saxons, newcomers, they, they give them different names and new names. So we've had a go at it, yeah. Is that, you know, any good? Yeah, it was another part of the time, but I don't know whether I want to take the same as myself. Oh, go ahead, you can. I'm not really familiar with it, but I got in some lime tea when I was down to Canada, and I thought, why the hell am I watching this? And now I realise that was why I watched it. There's a story. Uh, yeah, I, was just I haven't, no, but um, this uh, idea of a sword, uh, we know that the sword of Britain, as it were, Julius Caesar, in one of his forays into Britain, fought against a British prince named Nennius. They actually came against each other. And Julius wanged Nennius and hit him, uh, injured him, and he backed him a second time, but his sword got caught in the shield. They used to make a shield out of about ten layers of leather not metal, because metal is shatter. So they have a big, thick leather shield. Caesar's sword got wanged into the, the leather. Their soldiers on both sides tried to save each one of them, because they didn't want either of them killed, pulled them apart. This is the story. And so the British had Caesar's sword as a trophy. The great trophy, we got Caesar's sword. <laughs> you know, pretty good. They kept it. It certainly was believed to be around at the time of Constantine. The English king Athelstane had it, it's in his records, and uh, at one time through marriage it went to a, uh, a nobleman in, in Belgium and then came back. It's listed in the possessions of King John. Now English kings are frequently shown the two swords, you know, one in each hand sitting on the throne. So there were two swords. One sword, the other one, was dredged up in the Thames, they think that was that one, in the Thames. And uh, it's now in France, and uh, we've tracked that. In 1649, was it, Cromwell sawed off Charles I, and him executed? The Roundhead soldiers took all the treasures of the royal treasures, grabbed them. So Cromwell and his parliament did a sensible thing. They said, look, anybody bringing anything back, jewels, whatever you've got, you will not be punished, and you'll be paid a sum of money for bringing it back. You wanted to sell it black market, huh? I'll break it up. Everything came back except one thing, the sword. Didn't come back. In Pennsylvania, in the USA, a house that was built in 1650, 1649, 50, right? Was being altered in 1991. And they <laughs> took down a wall. And out of the wall fell a sword. Uh, it was sold to a man in Texas, who I know well, and he discovered I was in the States, and he wrote to Jim Michael, he texted him in Kentucky, in Louisville, and he sent up a 
for the stand up of the sword, right? Because there's writing down the blade. The writing is Kalman. Um, he then sent us a big photograph, big photograph of the sword, right? And it's Kalman writing, and it says, the duty of the host, meaning the army, the duty of the army host is to he who holds the sword. And it's in Welsh Kalman writing, down the blade. If there was an Excalibur, that's it. It's in uh, Houston in Texas. Uh, he was willing to bring it over to the British Museum with a guarantee that it was his property, but he would bring it over and put it on exhibition, and if he wished, he would wish to be able to take it back to the States, right? British Museum were wildly interested until he said, I'm coming over. And then they ran out of toilet paper. <laughs> so th there is a sword of antiquity, and you can track it down through the kings. If you went through the possessions of other kings for John, you'd probably find that they had it. But Athelstane had it, the great English king. He was probably the greatest of them. Um, and yeah, there is a track on Caesar's sword. Nice one? Yeah. Uh, I, I get round, don't I? <laughs> there you go. Anybody? So, um, you said that you went to the museum. Yes. Can we assume that's the same for every ancient civilization that gets wiped out? Like well, I mean, we're not supposed to be wiped out. We're supposed to be unified. Um, and when the Caxton invented printing, I uh, brought printing into London, 80, 1774, the first thing Parliament did was to pr prohibit printing in Wales. So you couldn't print in Wales till 1692, 200 years later, more. Uh, in 1846, Parliament pulled a right stroke in that they sacked every school teacher in Wales and sent an English school teacher in to replace them. So you had 90% plus of the Welsh population didn't know a word of English. Kids were all sitting there, spoken in Welsh. The teacher came in, he didn't speak any Welsh, he only spoke English. There was chaos. It, the Welsh called it the treachery of the blue books. And they'd done everything they can to kill the language. I told you, did I tell you the story about Betty Boothroyd? Did I? No. Paul Flynn, the MP for Newport in Gwent, gets up one day in the Commons and he starts reading from a little book. Betty Boothroyd was the chorus girl who became the speaker. Remember her? She leaps up. <laughs> Not one word of that language is ever to be spoken in this house. Actually, there's a law. You can't speak a single word of Welsh. You know it's common. It's a law. And she's rants on about, you know this, you know you're not to speak that language. And there were MPs rolling laughing. You could see them falling apart laughing. It's on TV. <laughs> and uh, I happened to be watching it. I've been warned about it, you see. So Flint, uh, he's read a bit more. You, I told you not to read that, you know. He said, Madam, I'm reading Old English from 14th century Chaucer. <laughs> but the thing is, remember an Israeli Prime Minister got murdered? What was his name? Aye. Well, when he was young, he was a member of the Stern Gang, who were terrorists, you see? And their speciality was to kidnap British soldiers, hold them for a while as hostages, and they let them go, they let them go, they murdered them. He was a terrorist. He later became Prime Minister of Israel. He got murdered. A very impressive <laughs> got paid his own coin. MP after MP, particularly Jews, got up in the House of Commons and said how sad they were for this former terrorist who murdered British soldiers who died. Some Jewish MPs got up and they spoke at length in Yiddish, Jewish. Nobody said a word. It's okay to speak Jewish in the House of Commons, but don't you say Yaki Da in Welsh, which means good, good, good on you. <laughs> Right? Okay. <laughs> what we got? Sir? Hi, there I don't know, sir, but I know there was a Prince Arthur up in Scotland in 600 to 610, and he's a real person. But he's not the Arthur of legend, unfortunately. Well, the 12 battles listed in Nennius have been traced and they take place in the north of England, over on the west coast, and in Scotland. So the, the 12, I mentioned Camlan and Baden and that, 
the 12 other battles fought the big campaign in Ennius, they're mainly in Scotland. And they've been accurately traced. So, anybody else? Uh, hey, that'll be it? Yeah. Well, you have to get hold of me outside. Go on, I'll take one more, all right? Well, Come on, what do you got? <laughs> Where is it available? Yeah. I sell books. <laughs> Now, you, you get the Land of Charters, which is a cascade. Uh, it, it, Welsh kings always give charters to the church, right? So you've got a king and his bishop. If the bishop dies, there's another one. When a king dies, that bishop goes serving the next one, right? They're always, a, they're, always a king's, sorry, they're always a king's brother or cousin or whatever. They kept it in the family. And you had all the clergy listed at this, this ceremony of granting the land for the monastery or something. And you had all the king and his brothers and sons in that listed. And you've got a cascade down the centuries through the charters from about 400 to 1100 odd. It helps then fill out, matches the genealogies, you see, and the histories. Each one fits together like a glove. There's no, no quarrels. Uh, they were taken to Rome in uh, 1108 and 1120 and shown to the Pope. So uh, we wrote the Pope and said, any chance of us coming to Vatican Library having a look, you know, at what you've got? And he said, yeah. But of course, we'd have the money to go. Because we were hoping there'd be the signatures of Arthur's treaties, you see. So you'd have an actual signature of King Arthur on a piece of paper. Oh, well. But we never got there, so we, as usual, we strapped for cash. I'd better beg him all out afterwards. All right, is that it? Thank you for listening.